All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday evening service. Let's begin, please, by opening our hymnals to page 425. 425. Let's stand together, please, and we will sing on page 425. Father, we praise you and we ask that you would be praised, Father, for all your greatness and your loving kindness in sending Jesus into the world. And surely we would not want to be ashamed of Jesus. Father, we know that um, he is, as it says, the bright and morning star and so many allusions to Jesus Christ there. And um, we want him to, to um, light our lives. And so, Father, we ask that you would give us strength tonight as we gather, that we would receive your words, learn, that we might be able to teach others also. Father, we ask you to bless our church, especially uh, those that are having physical needs. Father, we know some are not feeling well this evening. We ask that you would help them, strengthen them, Father, give them grace. Father, for those of us that are here, maybe tired or um, other um, concerns weighing heavily on our minds, Father, we just pray that you would wipe and those away, allow our minds to be stayed upon Jehovah and um, to be thinking about thee and to allow um, your word to sanctify us because as Jesus said, um, thy word is truth and that we're to be sanctified by the truth. Thy word is truth. So help it to set us apart, to make us holy, to make us more like thee, to fill our minds with heavenly thoughts, Father, that we could separate from earthly thoughts, Father, that 
So, um, you know, fill our minds and, and can easily keep us distracted all the time if we let them. So we want our, um, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Father, and to have a heavenly mindset and to be thinking about things having to do with Thee. Uh, we know forever and eternity we'll be able to enjoy um, you, and we want to begin that now, even in, as we think about you and think about your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thankful for the opportunity. You can look at Matthew 16 and verse 18, please. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Uh, we were going through the Ten Commandments, and we we're looking at Seventh day Adventism in connection to the Fourth Commandment in Bible study number three that we should wrap that up today, um, and it's good to be aware of what they teach, and then, Lord willing, uh, next time we'll go faster through the rest of the commandments here and keep going in study three, but we're going to wrap up the fourth commandment here and some things with Seventh-day Adventism, but let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to look at your word today. We pray that you strengthen the saints of God, help us to be equipped to deal with people who have uh, wrong ideas, and I pray that you'd help us to put in practice the principles behind the fourth commandment in our own lives. We do pray that you'd strengthen and help with that situation up in Jackson County, um, that you would help um, the family and just the whole situation there. We commit that to you and pray that you'd strengthen the Suttons and give them grace and wisdom uh, dealing with people there as well. And pray this for Jesus' sake and bless the message tonight. Amen. All right, so uh, we saw in previous weeks in connection with the fourth commandment that um, the Seventh-day Adventist organization teaches numbers of things that are different. It's not just that they worship Saturday, though that is their main recruiting technique, that they say it's Saturday, Saturday's the Sabbath, therefore you need to join us. But there's a lot more to it than that. So they add the uh, visions of Ellen White to scripture, while the Bible teaches that that scripture is sufficient, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is able to make the man of God perfect. Well, they say that Ellen White's visions are equally inspired to scripture. Even though, interestingly enough, I didn't mention this before, but Ellen White actually herself said that she's not infallible, though I guess she's somehow a prophet who's not infallible. Well, I guess false prophets aren't infallible, so I guess she was right. I agree with her statement that she was not infallible. Um, they also, the true church has always taught the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, while Adventism denied Trinitarianism for decades after it started, and then it changed and became kind of tritheistic, semi-Trinitarian. But that's a problem, because if they're the restored true church, why would they be worshiping uh, the devil for decades? Why was Mrs. White the prophetess worshiping the devil uh, for all this time with her husband and all the Adventist leaders, or they're the false religion now? They can't be both. I mean, this isn't just a minor thing. You know, whether it's the true God or not, that's kind of a big deal. So that's a big problem for them. Uh, the Bible teaches that, the, that God is omnipresent and the Father and the Holy Spirit don't have a body, only the Son has a body. While well, Adventism teaches that uh, the Father has a body, which is idolatry. And the Bible teaches that Jesus is the eternal God who has uh, created Michael the archangel and all the other angels. While well, Adventism teaches that Jesus is Mark, Michael the archangel. And they also teach, while the Bible teaches that Jesus united a, a sinless human nature to himself, Adventism teaches that Christ united a sinful human nature, and Christ actually could have sinned. And if he had sinned, the Father would have destroyed him. So Jesus would no longer exist, according to Adventism, if he had decided to sin. And thankfully, even though it was a big risk, he made the right decision, whew, and he didn't sin, and so Jesus still exists according to Adventism. You could see how this is consistent with denying the deity of Christ, but it's not consistent with our modern position that he is God. How could God get destroyed like that? Uh, the Bible teaches that the Father laid the sins of the world on Christ, and Christ paid for them all on the cross, while Adventism teaches that the sins of God people are put on Satan, and Satan takes them away, bearing the final penalty for sin. Uh, the Bible teaches that Christ completed the work of redemption or atonement on the cross, and that he uh, saves us by his death and shed blood, while Adventism teaches that Christ did not complete the work of atonement on the cross, but supposedly there was no uh, atonement made until 1844. I said, 1844? What does the Bible talk about 1844? They misinterpret a statement in Daniel about 2,300 days, make it into something it has nothing to do with, and then make this 1844 date up. And supposedly, Christ entered the heavenly sanctuary in 1844, and that's when the work of atonement only began. So Christ didn't actually make atonement. He only started until 1844, and the idea that actually our sins are transferred to heaven by Christ's blood is taught, which is just very evil. 
Uh, the Bible teaches that Christ's intercession as high priest guarantees our eternal security, and we're very, we rejoice in that. While Adventism teaches that in the last generation, which they think could be any time, the people will have to be saved without Christ as mediator. You will have to be as sinless as Adam, and you have to be saved without Christ as your mediator, which is, that would be a really bad situation. So we can be thankful it isn't true. Uh, the Bible teaches that we receive eternal life at the moment of repentant faith, apart from works. And because uh, God saves us based on his grace alone, we can know that we're saved. 1 John 5.13, like Brother Marlowe has been preaching through 1 John. Adventism teaches that uh, you can lose salvation and that grace for them is not saving, it's not the, that God saves us apart from any work that we do, but grace is the ability to do works in order to be saved. So that's their definition of grace, which is a false definition. And um, they also teach that no one should say that he uh, is saved, that no one, uh, while he still has uh, in this life, should say that. Um, the Bible teaches that we get eternal life simply by repentant faith, while they teach salvation is based on, on works. And right now, uh, there is an investigative judgment that's been going on since 1844, and people are being judged based on their works, whether they've done enough good works to stay saved or whether they lose it. Uh, the Bible teaches uh, as well that uh, when that the Holy Spirit is the down payment, the earnest of our salvation, while um, the, the Adventism teaches that the seal of God is not the Holy Spirit, but keeping the Sabbath is a seal of God. And the mark of the beast isn't an actual mark, but it's actually worshiping the first day of the week. So when you come to church the first day of the week, you've taken the mark of the beast, okay? Or it's, it's like a sign of the mark of the beast, all right? So they teach that, and of course, that's not in the Bible anywhere. Uh, the, the Bible also teaches that when a person dies, he's either in conscious bliss with the Lord or he's in the sad state of eternal torment. Well, Adventism teaches that you have soul sleep, you don't uh, go to hell, and you also don't go to heaven when you die. Um, the Bible teaches that the church and Israel are two different institutions, and the church is in Israel, and the church uh, celebrates, gathers on the Lord's Day while the Sabbath was for Israel, while they teach that they are the new Israel and that um, the Sabbath is the, the day where you have to worship. In fact, it's not just the day you have to worship, it's also, you know, the, the seal of God. So we, we, those are things we covered in previous weeks. You can see there's a lot more to it than just worshiping on Saturday. Uh, they also teach that the Pope changed the, the day of worship to, to from Saturday to Sunday, but there were no popes in, in the first century when they were worshiping the first day of the week, so that's also made up. So that's all stuff we covered before. But last thing that I wanted to talk about with them is uh, if you're in Matthew 16, 18 still, uh, the Bible says that uh, Christ here says uh, to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church would actually continue. Uh, in Matthew 20, in verse 20, in the Great Commission, it says that Christ would be with the church always even unto the end of the world. So Christ will be with the church till the end of the world. Ephesians 3 and verse 21 says, God will get glory in the church through Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So world without end, until, uh, through all ages, the church would exist and God would get glory in the church. So the church didn't disappear and it didn't need to be restored. And so Christ founded the church, and the Savior will preserve the church until he comes again. 1 Corinthians 11, 26, we're taking the Lord's Supper till Christ comes, and that's going to take place. Christ hasn't come yet, we're still taking the Lord's Supper. There are always true churches celebrating the Lord's Supper until Christ returns. Now, that's something that we talk more about in study number seven, but this eliminates Catholicism because their religion doesn't teach these things that are in the Bible, and also um, they... Uh, they many doctrines of Catholicism don't, didn't exist for centuries until after Christ started the church. Protestant denominations also don't fit this because, you know, Martin Luther didn't start the church in the 1500s. Jesus started the church in the first century. Nor did, you know, John Wesley. John Wesley was a sincere man, but he started Methodism. So if he's the one who started it, it can't be Jesus' church because Jesus started the church. It's his church, not, not the Methodist church or whatever, okay? Now, Seventh-day Adventist congregations, therefore, also can't be Christ's churches because Jesus didn't have to restore the church. It never went away. Uh, so when uh, we have a religion that's started by Ellen White and, and other people there with her in, in the 1800s, well, that's 1,800 years too late to have started the church. So it doesn't fit the biblical model at all. Uh, in contrast with this, Baptist churches have existed from the first century until today. Churches that believe in practice like this church have been around since Jesus started the church. 
They were known among on different names. Some of the names they were called by were, were Waldensians, Dontists, Cathari, Anabaptists. Anabaptists means rebaptizer. So because we didn't sprinkle little infants, they said you are rebaptizing people when you immerse them on profession of faith. So we were called Anabaptists. And non-Baptist historians have admitted that Baptists have existed way before the Protestant Reformation, that Baptists are not Protestants. So, for example, uh, we have a quote here from the Catholic Cardinal Hosius, who uh, administered the Catholic Council of Trent in 1560. And this council was actually called against the Protestants. This was the big Catholic anti-Protestant council. Well, what did he say about the Baptists? He said, The true origin of that sect which acquired the name of Anabaptists by their administering anew the rite of baptism to those who came over to their communion, is hid in the remote depths of antiquity, and is consequently extremely difficult to be ascertained. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that. That was what a Lutheran said. I skipped a quote. So the Lutherans say it's, we just keep going back and can't find out. What did the Catholic guy said? He said, the Catholic guy said, if the truth of religion were to be judged by the readiness and boldness of which a man of any sect shows in suffering, then the opinion and persuasion of no sect can be truer and surer than that of the Anabaptists. Since there have been none for these 1,200 years past that have been more generally punished. So here in the 1500s, he says the Anabaptists existed for 1,200 years, taking us back to the early period of early centuries of Christianity. Now, he didn't, couldn't really push any farther. If he'd said the Anabaptists have been punished since you know, the first century, that would kind of not sound good. So he just took us back 1,200 years and left it there. But we can clearly see he wasn't saying that these people are Protestants. So they just came out of nowhere and just started. What did uh, a Reformed writer say? He said, the Baptists descended from the tolerably pure evangelical Waldenses. Uh, they were, therefore, in existence long before the Reformed Church. We have seen that the Baptists, who were formerly called Anabaptists, were the original Waldenses and who have long in the history of the church received the honor of that origin. On this account, the Baptists may be considered the only Christian community which has stood since the apostles, and as a Christian society which has preserved pure the doctrine of the gospel through all ages. So here a Reformed writer says that the Baptists have existed since the time of the apostles and are, have preserved pure the doctrine of the gospel. Now, interestingly enough, Mrs. White herself recognizes that the Waldenses were where true churches were before the Reformation. So Ellen White, the prophetess of Adventism, said, <coughs> In lands beyond the jurisdiction of Rome, there existed for many centuries bodies of Christians who remained almost wholly free from papal corruption. They continued to regard the Bible as the only rule of faith. Of those who resisted the encroachments of the papal power, the Waldenses stood foremost. Theirs was not a faith newly received. Their religious belief was their inheritance from their fathers. They contended for the faith of the apostolic church. Hey, well, that sounds good. So, so even Ellen White said that the Waldenses were contending for the faith of the apostolic church. So, well, well, why don't they all leave and become Baptists then? Because the Waldenses were Baptists. What do they do about this? Well, Mrs. White claimed that the... So, so the, the Adventists would actually agree with us that the true churches were separate from Catholicism. But Ellen White pretended that the Waldenses were actually Seventh-day Adventist people, that they were Sabbatarian Adventist types. But that just isn't the case. Uh, it just simply is, is totally false. So, for example, uh, Samuel Bakayaki, I hope I pronounced his name right. This is a, a footnote, so it might be a little bit smaller print, but it, you can find the, the quote there somewhere. Uh, this is what he said. Uh, he was a professor of church history and theology at the Adventist Andrews University, and he wrote his doctoral thesis on the history of Saturday and Sunday worship. So he was a real smarty pants. What did he say? Did some of the Waldenses observe the Sabbath? He knew that they all did it, so he's just hoping that some of them did. He said, I searched for an answer in the scholarly volumes published by the official Italina Waldensian Publishing House, because the Waldenses were in northern Italy. Regarded as the most comprehensive history of the Waldenses. To my regret, I found no allusion whatsoever to Sabbath keeping among the Waldenses. The same search for historical evidences of Sabbath keeping among the Waldenses has been conducted by other Adventist scholars. Unfortunately, no connection to Sabbath keeping has been found. There are inaccuracies in the great controversy, that's Ellen White's book making this false claim, that ought to be corrected. So here, even uh, Adventist scholars recognize the Waldenses weren't Saturday worshipers. They were 
worshiped on the Lord's Day, just like us, because they were Baptists, okay? So uh, even their scholarly historians recognize that, that they just weren't that. Uh, what are some other things? Other historians have said the Waldenses observed no other day of rest than Sunday, whence they were named in Sabbathos, regardless not of the Sabbaths. So uh, their enemies said in around AD 1300 that the Waldensian belief was, we are to cease from working on no day except the Lord's Day. So that was the Waldensian belief. So the Waldensians worshipped the first day of the week. They weren't Sabbatarians. So if Ellen White recognized that they were the pre-Reformation true churches, well, hi, here we are. <laughs> you can join us anytime you like. Okay. The Waldensians also believed in the conscious bliss of the saved and the conscious torment of the lost, rejecting the Adventist doctrine of annihilationism or soul sleep. So they didn't believe in soul sleep. So this is from the Waldensies, quote, Confession of Faith, which dates to 1120. Uh, AD 1120. They said, quote, We believe that after this life there are only two places, the one for the saved and the other for the damned, the which two places we call paradise and hell. The ancient enemies of the Waldenses said, according to them, there is no purgatory. Well, amen for that. And all that die immediately pass either into heaven or hell. That was what they said they believed in 1200 AD. Uh, the souls of the deceased, uh, the Waldenses said, either immediately are plunged into hell or advanced to eternal joys. That's what the inquisitors who are torturing them said. They believed around 1300 AD. So we can clearly see they weren't Adventists. They worshipped the first day of the week. They believed in heaven and hell instead of soul sleep and annihilation. These are just people, they just aren't Adventists, Seventh Adventists. They also rejected the Adventist doctrine of salvation by works, believing the biblical and the Baptist doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. So here is a confession, a catechism they wrote for instructing their youth in the 13th century. So centuries before the Protestant Reformation, what did the Waldenses say about justification by faith? They said, that foundation by the which everyone may enter into life is the Lord Jesus Christ. By what means may a man come to this foundation? By faith, as saith St. Peter, 1 Peter 2, 6. Behold, I lay in Sion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And the Lord saith, he that believeth hath eternal life. And the Waldensian Catechism also goes on to affirm eternal security, which is also a Baptist doctrine versus an Adventist doctrine, based on the believer's election. They said, all the elect of God from the beginning of the world to the end, by the grace of God, through the merit of Christ, are gathered together by the Holy Spirit and foreordained to eternal life. So they believe in eternal security based on God's election, uh, which is true. We thank God for that. Uh, that Waldensies also held their Baptist doctrine of, uh, and rejected the SDA doctrine of sin and salvation centuries later when they confessed the depravity of man, total depravity, justification by grace through faith alone, and eternal security. So this is something they said a few centuries later. All the posterity of Adam is guilty of his disobedience and infected by his corruption and fall into the same calamity with him, even the very infants from their mother's womb, where it is derived the word of original sin. The Lord, having fully and absolutely reconciled us unto God through the blood of his cross, by virtue of his merit only, and not of our works, we are thereby absolved and justified in his sight. His blood cleanses us from all sin. We are united with Christ and made partakers of all his benefits by faith, trusting and confiding wholly to those promises of life which are given us in the gospel. All the elect are upheld and preserved by the power of God in such a sort that they all persevere in faith unto the end. So historians recognize that the Waldensian formularies hold the doctrine of justification, uh, being declared righteous, by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone, and of the final perseverance of the saints. So the Waldenses were Baptists. They were not Seventh-day Adventists. That just is not the case. So here we see that uh, what the Bible teaches matches what we have practiced here. Uh, we have church perpetuity from the first century to today. But the Adventist doctrine is that the Wallensees were somehow that like them, just isn't the case. So um, what does Adventism teach uh, instead of the Bible's doctrine of church perpetuity? Well, they teach that Satan has taken full possession of the churches. And actually, SDAs teach that Christians who aren't Adventists are worse than heathen savages. Though Mrs. White also said they should conceal the view that Christians are worse than pagan savages because it would hinder their evangelism. So she said, we consider them heathen. In truth, they are worse than heathen, but this we are not to tell them. <laughs> 
because it would close up the way before. So it'd make them more less, less likely to convert. I mean, you tell them you are worse than a heathen. I mean, it just doesn't help. You know, it doesn't help you convert to Seventh-day Adventism. So that's what they do. But what do we do when we evangelize? Well, we don't use the hidden things of dishonesty. We don't hide truth from people. We tell them the truth, like 2 Corinthians 4.2 says. We renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we don't lie to people to see them like that. So um, their religious history doesn't fit the Bible at all. So, so how do they justify their kind of coming into existence? How, where does this come from? Well, I'm going to give you the passage of the Bible that they say shows that it's about them, okay? Uh, go to Revelation chapter 14, please. And you may remember, a Pastor Stagger was doing a helpful series a while ago on different views like amillennialism and, and premillennialism and postmillennialism. Well, uh, if you're a premillennial, a uh, pre-tribulation person like we are, you know, Christ come back any moment, then seven years tribulation, thousand year reign, you can take the book of Revelation literally. You can take Bible prophecy literally. Okay? If you're an Adventist, you spiritualize the book of Revelation. You take a view called the historicist interpretation, which means that you try to take things in Revelation and you allegorize them into who knows what so that it fits into your little whatever you're trying to get out of it. So it doesn't really mean what it says. It means you know whatever you want. We're very thankful that this isn't how prophecy that was fulfilled in the first coming of Christ took place. I mean, imagine if Christ, you know, or somebody's claim to be the Messiah. Well, were you born in Bethlehem? Um, no, I was born in, uh, I was actually born in Syria. Well, it says my size is Bethlehem. Well, that just is an allegory. It doesn't really mean Bethlehem. It means, it means Syria. Okay. Were you born a virgin? Uh, no, I wasn't born a virgin. I was, but, but I, the constellation Virgo was in the sky when I was born. That's, there we go. So there we go. Close enough. You know, we can be thankful that the first coming prophecies of Christ were not spiritualized and just made up and, and whatever, but they were fulfilled literally. So we don't get to take the book of Revelation and spiritualize it into whatever we want, but this is what they do. So where does Advent, where, where do we see Adventism coming? Okay, well, it's in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. So we're going to read that now. We're going to read the part of the Bible that predicts Seventh-day Adventism. Are you ready? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. So you can clearly see from this text, it says that in 1844 in the eastern United States, Ellen White and her husband are going to restore the church based on worshiping on Saturday and teach all this other stuff, right? You can see that in there, right? I mean, that's clearly what it's about, right? It has absolutely nothing to do with it, right? I mean, it's, it's just craziness to say this is about them uh, being restored in the 1840s in the United States. Well, how do they get this out of this? Well, instead of it being literal heavenly angels preaching the everlasting gospel on the earth, well, that, that angel that's flying on the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel is supposedly about a man named William Miller, who in 1844 predicted the end of the world. And remember, 1844 is the big date for them. So Miller actually predicted the world would end and it failed, it didn't happen. So it's supposedly this angel is actually William Miller, who's predicting something about 1844. So that, I mean, you could just make it anything. If it means that, it could be anything. And now 1844, William Miller, the whole ends of the earth didn't hear about it. It was like in the Eastern US. So it wasn't to every kindred tongue nation. It wasn't even close, not even far less than 1% of the world heard about William Miller. So it's just made up stuff, okay? The 1844 date itself is made up. It's taking something in the book of Daniel about Antiochus Epiphanes and the Jerusalem temple and making it into something else that it's not. So that's actually where uh, supposedly this is coming out here, this is allegedly uh, talking about uh, William Miller in 1844. And um, then uh, also uh, where it says, and the third angel was saying, if any man worship the beast, 
you know, fear God and keep his commandments. Uh, this sort of thing is supposedly them predicting that you need to worship on Saturday, the Sabbath, but uh, the fear God and keep his commandments is just talking about keeping God's commandments. And actually, uh, every time that word commandments is used, I think we mentioned this last time, it's actually used for New Testament commandments. So it's not even about the Old Testament. It's about New Testament commandments every time John uses that word. So this is just allegorizing the, the Bible and making it into something that it just plainly is not. Okay? has nothing to do with it uh, at all. All right? So uh, that is their history. This, and this is the best you've got. So you can clearly see that it just doesn't, doesn't fit what Scripture says. So uh, all those things uh, clearly you should be aware of so you can help uh, people that are confused by Seventh-day Adventism and you can help them to believe the truth. Now, in the fourth commandment, though, there are certainly principles that relate to what we should do. The Saturday is uh, the Sabbath and Sunday is the Lord's Day and Saturday is, is for the Jews. And, uh, but there are principles we should apply to the Lord's Day. We have more liberty as we think about the Fourth Commandment principles than the Jews had on Saturday, but these are some things that I think are worth thinking about. I'm going to give you some uh, uh, quote here. If you can get the other, other thing up. Um, we have some statements here about uh, some good things to think about about the Lord's Day and some principles that we can apply so that as we're talking about this, we certainly shouldn't be hypocrites and not actually practicing what what scripture does teach uh, as we are going through the, these Bible studies with people. So this is from the Westminster Larger Catechism. They, they make the mistake of saying the Lord's Day is a Sabbath instead of there just being principles, and that's wrong. But uh, here are some, some things they said. How is the Lord's Day to be sanctified? The Lord's Day is to be sanctified by a holy resting all the day, not only from such works as are at all times sinful, but even from such worldly employments and recreations as are on other days lawful, and making it our delight to spend the whole time, except so much of it as is to be taken up in works of necessity and mercy, in the public and private exercises of God's worship. And to that end, we are to prepare our hearts, and with such foresight, diligence, and moderation to dispose and seasonably dispatch our worldly business that we may be the more free and fit for the duties of that day. And we don't have time to look up all the references in there, but you, that, those are good principles. Those are good Lord's Day principles. Think about how the fact that day before the Sabbath was called the day of preparation. They prepared for it. That's a, I think it's a good principle for us. Now, sometimes things happen on the Lord's Day and it's unavoidable that you know, your tire goes flat or whatever. Okay, it's fine. But if you can try to prepare the day before so you have more time to think about spiritual things, that's a good principle. It's good to try to do that. Um, so we can focus on spiritual things that day. Uh, it's good that we should think about, you know, what are we thinking about and talking about? You know, uh, probably even on other days of the week, we probably uh, don't need to spend as much time on social media and <clears throat> talking about things that don't really matter as we do, but how much the more on the Lord's Day? You know, after we hear a great sermon from our pastor or a great Sunday school lesson or whatever, are we just talking about stuff that doesn't even relate to it or are we actually edifying one another? Are we building each other up, thinking about the things of God? Are we talking about what we learned in God's house during lunchtime? Uh, are we actually treating the Lord's Day as if it's special, the day that Jesus rose from the dead? So those, those are some good principles, I think, that we can practice. And let's not, let's not uh, teach people this and then be hypocritical and not think about these things. Uh, next question. Uh, why is the charge of keeping the Lord's Day more specially directed to governors of families or other superiors? Because uh, remember, it says nor, neither, you, know, you keep it and your house and your wife and your children. So why is the, the head of the household specifically addressed? <coughs> the, the, and of course, again, the Saturday is the Sabbath. Lord's Day is not the Sabbath. We're just taking some principles, okay? The charge of keeping the Sabbath is more specially directed to governors of families and other superiors because they are bound not only to keep it themselves, but to see that it be observed by all those that are under their charge. And because they are prone, oft times they hinder them by employments of their own. Do we try to make sure that our spouses, do we try to make sure our children actually are able to set the Lord's Day apart and devote it to things of God? I think that's a good principle. We should think about that. What are the sins forbidden in the fourth commandment? The sins forbidden in the fourth commandment are all omissions of the duties required, all careless, negligent, and unprofitable performing of them. So you come to church, you don't pay attention, or you, you know, you every time you come to church, uh, the, the, the little kid has his ants in his pants, needs to go to the restroom, you know, five times during the service. You know, maybe, maybe you know, go before, okay, so you can sit and pay attention. Uh, careless, negligent, unprofitable performing of them. 
being weary of them. Oh, did go to church again? All profaning the day by idleness and doing that which is in itself sinful and by all needless works, words, and thoughts about our worldly employments and recreations. It's good to be able to try to think, think about things differently. Maybe make Saturday a day that you know, you don't, you, you get all, now sometimes with your, if you have a, some jobs, you just can't do anything about it, but try, I think it's good to try as much as possible to get that stuff done Saturday, and, and so you can have Sunday be different. Maybe make Sunday a day you don't check your email, or Sunday a day you don't, um, you don't actually go on your social media, or, or, or just treat it like, like it's actually the Lord's Day. Good things to think about. Um, what are the reasons next to the fourth commandment? The more to enforce it. The reasons annexed to the fourth commandment, the more to enforce it, are taken from the equity of it, God allowing us six days of seven for our own affairs, and reserving but one for himself in these words, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, from God's challenging a special propriety in that day, seventh day is Sabbath, Lord thy God, from the example of God, who in six days made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is, and rest of the seventh day, and from that blessing which God put upon that day, not only sanctifying it to be a day for his service, but in ordaining it to be a means of blessing to us in our sanctifying it. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And then, why is the word remember set at the beginning of the fourth commandment? The word remember is set in the beginning of the fourth commandment, partly because of the great benefit of remembering it, we being thereby helped in our preparation to keep it, and in keeping it, better to keep all the rest of the commandments and to continue a thankful remembrance of the two great benefits of creation and redemption, which contain a short abridgment of religion, and partly because we are very ready to forget it, for that there is less light of nature for it, and yet it restrains our natural liberty and things at other times lawful, that it comes but once in seven days, and many worldly businesses come between, and too often take off our minds from thinking of it, either to prepare for it or sanctify it, and that Satan with his instruments labors much to blot out the glory and even the memory of it, to bring in all religion and impiety. So those are just some principles from the fourth commandment. Now, since the Lord's Day is not the Sabbath, uh, we have more liberty than the Jews did, okay? And so I would say in applying these principles, let's, let's apply them to ourselves ten times as strictly as to someone else. So you see somebody else doing something on the Lord's Day that maybe you wouldn't, well, make, apply your, it to yourself ten times. Have a big magnifying glass on you and a small magnifying glass uh, on, on other people. But I think these are principles that we should think about. You know, we should think about what we do on the first day of the week. Uh, we, we talked about a bunch of other stuff with the fourth commandment already, I think. But we should, uh, I'll, I'll uh, just look at Psalm 122. Psalm 122 and verse 1. And let's make sure that this is our attitude. As we get to come worship the Lord on the day that he rose from the grave, uh, not the day that he's dead in the tomb, but the day that he rose from the grave, let's actually make sure this is our attitude as we come. So here in Psalm 122, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates of Jerusalem. So is that your attitude? Are you glad when you get to come into the house of the Lord? Or is it just a matter of duty for you? Okay, is it just a place you come because you have to come and then you get out of there as quick as you can? Remember also, like in Isaiah, God said that he hated the burnt offerings and the sacrifices of the people, even though they were actually ordained by God. Why did he hate them? Because they were hypocrites. They weren't living for him the rest of the week. So let's make sure that the rest of the week, we're actually living a consistent life, pleasing to the Lord, so that we, don't, we aren't like the Jews who were fake the whole week and then came to the temple and thought everything was going to be okay. Now, if you are being a hypocrite, you should still come to church because maybe God will work in your life and you get to stop being a hypocrite, okay? But, but don't think that you can please the Lord while you're displeasing him the whole week and then you come to church and all of a sudden you're Mr. Spiritual, you know, super person, okay? Uh, that isn't actually what God wants. God wants us to be consistent uh, uh, the whole week. Uh, our children know whether we're consistent. Our spouses know whether we're consistent. God knows whether we're consistent. Let's be consistent in what, how we treat and love the worship of God. Even something, now, th this isn't the Lord's Day, this is Wednesday, but man, let's actually take our prayer time seriously. Let's make it, this is a time we have the privilege of corporately seeking the Lord's face. 
Just like we have other times. There's men's prayer on Saturdays. There's the, uh, during the missionary, uh, the, the Thursday night for the ladies, the time of prayer. Let's take those times of prayer seriously. I mean, we get to address the living God who, as typed in the Sabbath, has actually created us, has redeemed us by his grace. What a privilege to be able to approach him, strengthened by the Spirit through Christ, and come to the Father. What an amazing privilege. Let's take these things seriously. Let's be glad when we come into the house of the Lord. Let's have the attitude of, of, of the psalmist when he said that his soul longed and fainted for the courts of the Lord, and his soul cried out for the living God. So it's good for us to know the problems with Sabbatarianism, but let's also make sure that we have a consistent worship ourselves so that we actually are honoring the Lord, not just with the knowledge that we have, but with our actual practice in our lives. Uh, Lord willing, we will get faster through these other commandments later. And remember, we're talking about more mainly other religions in study number seven, but I thought this was an appropriate place just to, to talk about uh, Adventists and, and you know, right here with, with the fourth commandment. So hopefully that will strengthen you and it will be able to be effective in reaching them and you'll also be effective in actually living the kind of life that is consistent with the glorious fact that Christ has uh, saved you by his grace alone and has um, rose from the dead, conquering death on your behalf. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for this study that we were able to wrap up today with the fourth commandment. I pray that you'd help us to be consistent in ourselves with the principles in the fourth commandment. Let us help us to be people who really love your worship, to take it very seriously, and help us to be equipped to help those who uh, have these, these false, confusing, dangerous ideas that, that are just not in the Bible, and be able to help them. Uh, understand the truth and, and come to repentance. I pray that you give the members of our church doors of utterance for the gospel and opportunities to start evangelistic Bible studies with people. And you pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.